Welcome. I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Thank you for joining our webinar, Scaling Biotech Companies in Montana. Today's session is co-hosted by the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. We are recording this session and the video will be made available on our website and emailed to everyone who registered. If you have questions, you can type them in the chat box or unmute your microphone to speak. And I would now like to turn the floor over to Cassandra Sennell, Outreach Director at the Montana World Trade Center, to say a few words on behalf of the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. Cassandra? Good morning. Thank you for participating in this morning's webinar. My name is Cassandra, and I'm the Outreach and Project Director for the Montana World Trade Center and Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about the cluster, in 2018, we were one of seven states to receive funding from the Small Business Administration to assist in the efforts to grow our bioscience ecosystem in Montana. Um, we do this in various different ways through building out our workforce, peer-to-peer -peer engagement, and our fourth F fund, uh, which is a gap fund uh, of up to $5,000 uh, to help entrepreneurs and small businesses in their bioscience efforts. Uh, we are in a partnership and coalition with uh, several other entities in Montana, uh, the World Trade Center, the Montana Technology Enterprise Center, or otherwise known as Montech, the Montana Bioscience Alliance, the University of Montana, Swan Valley Medical, and Missoula Economic Partnership. Uh, we look forward to being a part of this webinar with you and thank uh, Christina and the Montana High Tech Business Alliance for hosting this invaluable webinar. If you have any questions about the 4th F Fund or the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative and our work, please visit mtbioscience.com or operations at mwtc.org. I'll also add that information to the chat. Thank you. Uh, we are pleased today to hear from four diverse professionals to provide actionable insights into how individual companies can plan for growth and also how we can scale Montana's biotech ecosystem. Liz Markey will serve as our moderator. She is head of community engagement for Two Bear Capital and Whitefish and also was the founder of Frontier Angel Fund. Choice LaRue is our financial and leasing expert with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Matt Malott is commercial real estate advisor with a background in lab space and R&D development with Sterling CRE in Missoula. And Cynthia eckbert Sai is the CEO of HelpQuest and an advisor for business development in biotechnology and medical technologies based in Wolf Creek, Montana. Now I would like to turn the floor over to Liz to get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you. I love the collaboration of this group. Um, I'm gonna start briefly by um, making some remarks uh, about a recent uh, study that all of the parties above mentioned were involved in, including the Chamber of Commerce and the Montana Department of Commerce, the World Trade Center, and obviously our anchor um, organization, the Montana uh, Bioscience Alliance, which I was very active in 22 years ago when Sharon founded it. And then I realized I didn't know anything about science. So we decided not to do any science investing. But Fast forward 20 years, I think we are at the uh, dawn of a very new age in Montana. Uh, we are very nascent. We're at the very beginning, as we've learned in the tech and the and the uh, and the uh, technology ecosystem. It's it's not just one thing; it's many things. And one of um, Profitable Ideas Exchange, which is a group based in Bozeman, which works internationally with uh, C-level executives, uh, undertook uh, a sort of a survey study with really some of our top people like Herb Weissman and Renee Ray Hopera, uh, Leroy Hood, Maury, of course Maurice Hillman has passed away, but really um, looking at, we've always punched well above our weight in life science. But um, with the dawn of technologies and, and my boss, Mike Gogan, is just 
absolutely convinced that the intersection of electrical engineering and biology is happening, that we're going to be able to code the human body, and it's not going to be easy. Science is really, really hard. But they identified four or five things I just want to share with you that are very essential if we are going to compete globally, and we are competing globally if we're not just in Montana, um, in the life science business. First is PhDs. We're going to have to have a lot more uh, research talent and train a lot more research talent and attract a lot more to our state. Um, we clearly need um, more venture capital. Our fund is writes early stage seed and Series A checks generally uh, between three and $30 million. Um, but we are looking for platform changing opportunities and we don't invest in one shot on goal. Uh, just a molecule. And, and that's a lot of bioscience companies today. That's not our wheelhouse. So we need more, a lot more venture capital. They don't have to be here, but um, we need to be uh, respected by other venture capitalists and we need to work and co-invest with them across the country. And you may know we are headquartered in Montana, but we do have offices in Menlo Park and in San Diego and Boston, which are the two real deep hubs of life science opportunity in the U.S. Um, we need much more collaboration. Sharon's done a beautiful job, but we still, because of geography and, la and lack of lab space, there's still a lot more knitting that we need to do together as a community in life sciences. Um, and the, we need more mentors. Um, and you know those are coming slowly. And um, I think uh, the other thing that everybody mentioned uh, is our housing market is just still really a tough space. And we, and we do lack collaborative lab space. Um, one of the interesting things I do want to note is while we talk about lab space a lot, almost every one of our companies that we're invested in is a distributed company. So it's not just uh, tech people that are working remotely, it is scientists. I want to start with Cynthia because she is a very special duck in the pond. Um, they're not she was not trained as a scientist, but she's an excellent investor, partially because of her background and her time that she spent in San Diego. But Cynthia, I'd like to, for you to talk a little bit about your career, what you're investing in, and sort of what you see in, in your deal flow world and um, how that all knits in with us in Montana. Well, thank you, Liz. I think that Montana has the best brand in the U.S. today. Everybody is interested, and maybe some of the interesting television programming of Yellowstone has created some of that, but people want to be in Montana. Maybe they're here this weekend for skiing, but the life sciences area is very exciting. And when you look at our history vaccine area and some of the other interesting opportunities that Montana has created for the world, it's very important. My background is in life sciences because I was in the right geography in San Diego in the early 80s when biotech was just forming. I made my first million dollars investing in one of those biotech companies on Torrey Pines Road and probably nothing is more encouraging for an investor than to make money in an area. And I've continued my work in the biotech area and med technologies. I'm an investor in several Montana-based companies, several Montana uh, biotech, and uh, it's also been important to reach beyond the Montana borders. I've just joined the board of a company involved in robotic surgery that's based out of Boston, and uh, a long history in the New York biotech industry as well, but the sweet spot for me, I've found that meeting the people in the industry has been one of the most rewarding things. And I continue to be active in investing in this area. As a matter of fact, one of the recent deals, very early stage biotech, Colbert Kravis has just invested $3 million. So don't think there's anybody that's too big or too small that can't be your investor. Good advice. Matt, I know that you are sort of got your thumb on um, the space issue, and we do hear a lot about that from the universities, from our researchers, from our fledgling companies about the difficulty and the cost of space in Montana. So can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, so uh, my name is Matt Malott. We work in the commercial real estate broker, and then we work in management and 
brokerage and development even of uh, lab and R&D space. Uh, we do other things too uh, in the commercial real estate world, but have worked in the lab and R&D space. Um, and, you know, there's numerous difficulties that are associated with it. If you are on, you know, in Sereno Valley in, in uh, San Diego uh, and you're an investor or a developer building spec uh, R&D space uh, or, you know, life science space is a smart investment because there's a cluster there and the demand for that space is high. In a place like Montana where you don't necessarily have, uh, you know, a center of gravity or, you know, um, a kind of critical mass or whatever, you know, cliche you want to use for it, it is very difficult to get spec development of lab space. Um, and so when you have users, whoever they are, whether they're startups or further along the line, uh, looking for lab space, it is extremely hard to come by, um, you know, in, in Missoula, especially in, in places like Bozeman uh, as well. So uh, because of that, because you don't have this great big mass of, of users, uh, a lot of the, if lab space is going to be built, a lot of it needs to be uh, planned out far in advance in terms of users identifying what their needs are and then either working on some sort of build a suit arrangement or some sort of like uh, early engagement on a lease of space. And that is, I think one of the key things that we've seen is people want the space right now or groups want the space right now, the lab space with all the amenities uh, and it's more or less doesn't exist currently uh, in Montana. Uh, there's some exceptions. So, you know, Tonics being a good example where they're coming in and they're building their own facility uh, from scratch, uh, but that's, I mean, they closed on the land two years ago and still not broken ground or be another year plus until that thing is up and running. So the, the lead time on these things are, are pretty long. Interesting. And Joyce, talk a little bit about how uh, Thorough Fisher works with companies and what you could provide fledgling startups. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, everybody online today. Uh, my name is Choice LaRue. I'm with Thermal Fisher Scientific, um, part of the Thermal Fisher or the Global Financial Solutions team. Uh, we're a captive leasing company um, for our um, uh, organization. And what we provide is payment solutions for our customers when they come in and they're looking to um, buy products, uh, laboratory equipment, um, and uh, anything they buy through our sales divisions. Um, and they are looking to extend the payment term over a period instead of paying uh, full cash, uh, cash for upfront. Um, so what we do is we like to partner with early stage um, and startup biotech companies and get a sense of um, what they're looking to purchase. Um, typically, uh, we can provide very competitive rates for anything sold through uh, Thermal Fisher Scientific, all our thermal products and anything that can be sourced through Fisher Scientific. And we look to provide financing options for that customer so they don't have to have 100% capital investment up front. They can manage their cash flows a little bit better and uh, preserve that uh, capital on hand so they can uh, extend their cash runways and maintain their business. So, Tris, I have a question for you. Do you deal at all in used lab equipment? Um, you know what? That's a very good question. Yes, I have financed some laboratory equipment in the past. Um, typically what we'll get is we'll get a thermal customer that comes in and they have a product package that has um, various parts and um, products from Thermo, and then they want a used product that we're able to roll into the package. So yeah, we do use products. Um, it, just, it just depends on what, what comes across the table and what we can help them with. And, and my, my gut feeling is that your business has been growing year over year for the last three to four years pretty rapidly. Uh, yeah, we've achieved uh, for the financial services team, we've, we've achieved at least 20 percent year over year growth with early stage um, startup biotechs looking to just extend their cash runways, be able to preserve their capital on hand um, so they can buy more product and uh, do their research. A lot more opportunity. And I'm going to unabashedly pl plug a company out of Bozeman um, that Frontier Fund 2 invested in. Um, you know, Bozeman has a pretty significant photonics cluster there. Mm -hmm. And um, two entrepreneurs who were in that industry uh, realized that people were buying used laser equipment for catalogs still, because when you spec scientific equipment, it is very specific. <laughs> and there wasn't a search, a way to search specs. Um, and they figured out a very nifty way to uh, do that on very complex equipment. And they're really kind of taking off. They're two or three years old, but research lab source is there. And um, I, one of the things that we see all over in our investment portfolio, I mean, we are seeing astounding um, work being done by two entrepreneurs in a lab. Um, 
And uh, I, I really uh, agree with Cynthia that um, there's there's nobody who can't begin to invest in life sciences, even though I do. I have to say it's it can be intimidating, uh, but somebody does know the science. I mean, they really do. And I would really like for um, uh, to talk about it's a very big arc of opportunity in life science. I mean, it's everything from molecules to robotics to equipment. And um, I think of Montana, uh, Cynthia, I'd like for you to speak to this. Do you see two or three areas that you think might be um, fortuitous for us to really focus on developing some expertise? And I'm asking this question because I, I been in Colorado quite a bit when they were be really beginning to show up in the life science world. And they have really kind of doubled down on uh, diagnostics and, um, uh, you know, things that require, they have design, manufacturing, uh, uh, testing, uh, you know, all the authorizations. So where do you see that over the next five years or 10 years that we might really start doubling down on, on various verticals in the life science world? Well, I think we have to start first with the talent, and you mentioned PhDs are very significant, as well as the people that lead these scientists. Mm -hmm. And I believe that certainly the McLaughlin Institute, with the work they're doing and the grants they've focused on for Alzheimer's, is a very significant area. We know that there have not been as much as many successes as we'd like to see, and it's a very significant problem. I think that uh, the Bozeman area, the hub that is built around that has been very significant and great science around it. But Liz, I still want to really underline that it is really about the people. If we could attract the scientists that we have already attracted and build on their relationships to bring other scientists here, I think that we could almost go any direction. When you look at the work that's going on in Hamilton with advent vaccines uh, for shingles and for a lot of the other novel technologies that will come out, I think those are going to be very significant. And we're building on those. We're building on what has been successful in Hamilton already. But at the end of the day, I really want to emphasize that investors, and you know this from Two Bear, we invest in people first. Those are the, the leading most important things. I know scientists get excited about their technology, but at the end of the day, we're gonna look at who they are, their track record, who they've put on their board, who are their advisors, what do they like to do for fun? What are they like as people? So those are the things that I would say, but cardiovascular health is becoming much more significant for men and women. And diabetes is a very, substantial challenge in the US as well as globally. But I would say first find the great people that we can attract here. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's one of the reasons that our firm um, will be building probably in the next two years where as you said, Matt, it takes a long time to spec out. Uh, we're building two bear labs here in, in Whitefish on 27 acres um, and Mike's vision for that is that we will have a world-class place where the best and the brightest can come together to solve problems with the best equipment, where any number of our portfolio companies would love to relocate from Boston or New York or San Diego to Montana, or certainly they'd love to be here part of the year. Um, and I, I agree with you. I, it really is about relationships and talent. And um, we're also very lucky, speaking of people, to have Cynthia here, who's been very involved in the Galen Awards, which is really one of the premier events in life science in the, in the country. Um, and plus just the opportunity to, um, this week is JP Morgan, um, the opportunity to participate in so many things remotely. I mean, COVID's really been a huge blessing for those of us here in Montana. Um, we are also working to bring, uh, we, uh, we just think the more people we can bring here um, in, the, in the life science world, the more opportunity we'll have to build um, uh, uh, an ecosystem here. Um, so Joyce, talk to me a little bit about uh, 
just what what you've seen. Have you have you been in covering Montana for a number of years? Yeah, I've been with the financial services team uh, going over six years now, and I've done a couple opportunities in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Montana is um, not one not one of the states that uh, comes to mind that I've done a recent opportunity with. Okay. But we typically start with a, a quote, our sales teams um, engaging with the biotech customer, and they hear about our financial solutions options, um, that they can pay for this over a period of time instead of upfront or net 30. And they get them in touch with me. We look at a credit approval forum, and we present terms. Um, being in an internal division to Thermo Fisher Scientific, we're not, we have very competitive rates because we're not necessarily a profit center. We're just looking to provide a payment solution for the customer. And if the customer likes the terms we're able to offer, we write out a contract and they move forward with the purchase, the product shipped directly to them, and then they make monthly payments on it. So when you, um, so when you're working with an early stage company, describe to me sort of the engagement. Do they come to you very early? I mean, because, you know, you can't do research with that equipment. You need, <laughs> you need certain things. So, you know, at what point in the cycle do they come to you? Are you able to help them spec their their needs? I mean, do you do you work with them in that way? Or are you strictly a finance guy, or or can you refer them to other people in your company? You know what? That's a good question. Um, typically, the Fisher um, or the Thermo Sales Associate, who is probably more the product expert on what the customer is looking to purchase, um, is engagement with the is engaging with the biotech customer. And um, at that stage, they bring us in if the customer is looking for a payment option, and then we come in. I just am strictly financing, but periodically we do receive request directly from the customer, and then we connect them with the appropriate sales team that covers that specific product to be able to get all the bells and whistles that the customer actually needs for their process. Um, so they, they get what they need, and then if they want the, the finance option or the payment option, then I work out the payment agreement. Um, typically, the conversation starts with the lab personnel, either the lab manager or the actual scientist. But quickly from there, if we go forward with the credit application process, I engage the C-suite um, uh, company personnel, CFO, CEO, and we get all the necessary financials from them, um, credit app, and then we move forward with the package directly with the C-suite. Okay, so what if you don't have a C-suite? What if it's uh, you know two guys in a, in a room? Um, there, um, then we then we're working with directly with the owner or the president. Okay. Of the company. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think there's, um, it, it's a, it's a mysterious world of the lab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, for one thing, you, I, I love Dr. Bloom. I, our team was about to go down to the, um, I called him up, you know, Rocky Mountain Labs is the, is a stage four NIH lab. And it's actually the second largest lab in the United States. And I called up Dr. Bloom and I said, oh, we want to bring our team down. And he said, Liz, I can't even get in my lab. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, there's, there is this, you know, it's not, it's not uh, every man on the street. So I think there's a lot of demystifying that we need to do about the process and the procedure. And the same thing, question to you, Matt, when you start beginning, I mean, I know you're specking some some lab space now correct uh the, the design of it, the initial design to the shell yes uh, but okay. kind of pending moving forward on it on who the end user is because you can you can design it improperly or build it out improperly yeah. if you don't know who the user is in terms of their you know various uh, ventilation requirements and all yeah. that sort of thing so yeah and, and are you looking at i mean do you go ahead and do that right now i mean are you putting in hoods and ventilation or are you just really building a shell waiting for somebody to to come to you it, the, i mean you try to make it as generic as you can in terms of the ventilation uh, ducting and so forth so that it can accommodate a wide variety of users but there can be pretty substantial uh, deviation or variation between different users depending on exactly what they do um so yeah i mean where you run into problems is unless you have a wind up tenant that has uh, uh you know credit uh, effectively it gets difficult on the financing side in a place like montana uh, to do these spec projects, um, at least at, at you know the scale that we're discussing here, um, in, unless you've got a, a user lined up to to go into it, because otherwise you build the property and if it doesn't get leased up, now you've got um, your market, who you can market to is relatively small, 
Uh, so that has been a pretty consistent challenge, at least in Missoula. Uh, I think even, you know, places like Hamilton is a smaller market, even though it's got this great little bio cluster forming, it's just hard to attract uh, kind of debt uh, to those those deals uh, for banks to finance them. So. And do you have, are there other sources of financing besides banks that you can go to in the life science world? There are some, yeah. I mean, the there are debt funds and things like that out there that are not conventional banks uh, that will invest in these. And but again, they're also looking for the critical mass to say, okay, if we finance this and we somehow get the building back, who else are we going to run into without having to do some massive, uh, you know, renovation or remodel of the property? So if you're, you know, building in in Boston or uh, building in San Diego, then that is easy, relatively easy money to come by uh, because you've got this wide market to fill in your space. Uh, at, at present, anyway, in, in Montana, it's it is relatively uh, challenging unless your your developer has a vested interest in the companies that are going in there as it can to seed it um, to seed the the project. So. That is one advantage, I think, with the, the two bear campus and so forth, is that if you've got the developer and the you know investment group in the actual companies themselves, and there's like you're, you're effectively doing purpose built or or some percentage of your project is purpose built for uh, uh, specific users. Yeah, but I will say it's been a lot more complicated designing than we ever imagined yeah. it would be, and we have some really heavy hitters in, involved. Choice, uh, we've had a question in the chat about can you offer favorable financing rates to nonprofits that might want to build a wet lab space? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, our uh, nonprofits are uh, much easier to get approved um, from what my experience, just because they typically have a lot of um, grant funding um, coming in and we have payment options. I did a payment option for one nonprofit in the Midwest that was basically, they had a $200,000 uh, purchase order limit with one of our sales divisions and they needed to buy 750,000 in product. So we basically gave them a finance option. It was a six month finance option on the additional 500 K so they could get everything they needed immediately. So definitely we work with all customer segments. Okay. Um, so Cynthia, did you have something you were going to add? No, I'm, I'm just taking notes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, I was I was going to say something about, and actually, somebody in the chat says, um, "Are there do you do you have different rates for opportunity zone financings?" You know, that's it, actually a great question because yeah, we have is. a rate promotion going on. We're offering subprime financing rates um, across all of our payment terms from twelve months out to sixty months for our customers. Um, there are rate buckets, early stage um, startup biotech's max rate that they're going to get if they if they get it once they're approved is six percent across all of our terms, and then it kind of steps down five percent for established customers, um, returning customers that have a good balance sheet, and then for our tier one investment grade um, credits, they're getting the um, our our best rates are anywhere from three and a half to four percent. And Matt, are you doing any work in opportunity zones? Mm -hmm. We have, yes, we've done uh, numerous, not not specific to lab or R&D uh, facilities, but in, you know, in other areas and arenas, we've done uh, quite a bit in opportunity zones. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to mention just a couple of things um, while I, we've got this group together. Um, in March, Cynthia, I know you're um, bringing Wilson Sansini to Montana. Um, they're our attorney, and we do a lot of work with them. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because another piece that's very important in our ecosystem is intellectual property. It's uh, very, very important in, in biotech. Uh, and that's another um, professional services group that we're pretty thin in. But thank God, you know, we're we're actually just a phone call away from lots of lots of very, very qualified people. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Event. I'd love to. On March 6th in Bozeman, we will be hosting a free event for investors for early stage biotech, high tech companies that will allow them to have access to four of the partners from Wilson Sansini. They're coming from Silicon Valley. So they are the team that has done a lot of the work for early stage companies, as well as mergers and acquisitions. But one of the big focus, as you mentioned, Liz, is going to be on intellectual property. It's also going to be how to put opportunities together. And I think having 
this dynamic team who I've been working with for a number of years and some of them are new partners. Uh, they've been active in the Rocky Mountain region. They open an office in Salt Lake and they have one in Colorado, but they don't have an office here. I think it's a great opportunity for companies and individuals that want to meet the Wilson Sonsini team that will be here all day on the, the 6th uh, in Bozeman to ask questions from some of these real thought leaders. And I've been working with them on a number of companies that I've been very impressed with their style, their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And again, it's something that young companies sometimes uh, need a little guidance when they're also negotiating tech transfer. So that's another area that James Huey and Matt Myers will be talking about as well. But I think it's really giving access to our Montana executives and leaders a chance to ask questions and be there in person. Yeah, and that of all the di biggest differences between the kind of technology investing that I've done most of my life versus life science is the value and the quality of intellectual property is paramount today particularly with, um, and, and we're finding also, and we're invested in several companies. Uh, in fact, Mike Elmore, who's head of, he's the chief information officer and security officer at Glaxo is on our advisory board because security is, data security is critical in life science. And in the areas that we're in, like bioinformatics, where you're sharing massive amounts of protected data to be able to guarantee security, uh, as you're, as you're, you know, doing algorithms and research is really, really important. But that's one event I definitely wanted to mention. And someone has posted a question about uh, uh, ethanol, which, uh, and, and I, I thank you for doing that because I don't know how many of you are aware that on January 24th, you know, Life Science in Montana, we have an enormous amount of research in the ag space. And um, on January 24th in Great Falls is the very first Montana Ag Investment Summit. So um, I, uh, I, th there's a website for the event um, and anybody who's interested in, you know, there's just a whole new world around food and energy and, um, I know that their invited keynote is the sustainable manager for um, Rupert Murdoch's uh, now three ranches in Montana. Um, and he's going to talk about why they have bought both the Matador and the Lascense Ranch, um, and in addition to the ranch he already had and what he sees going forward, because I think that's one of our least uh, understood areas here. And part of that is, you know, we just haven't had a lot of investment capital here, uh, a private capital in that area. We get a ton of grants. Um, we're still in the top three in the U.S. and SBIR and STTR. Um, let's see, what, um, what other events, there was one other event I wanted to mention and I can't remember what it was, but I just, I, we, we must take advantage of those things. Uh, also, uh, Two Bear Capital is a sponsor of Athena, which is the only women's focused uh, biotech organization in the world. It's in San Diego. One of our uh, partners is on the board there. And Athena just offers a plethora of you know, classes, programs, mentorship um, in, in building a biotech company. It's a different animal. And I think it's a business that if you're building, it's just critically important to have mentors in. Um, so on a macro level, um, what are you seeing just trends in the industry over the next five years? I know that I'm seeing... Um, distributed companies, which I think is a very different thing that people aren't thinking about. Um, we're seeing just whole new repurposing of research that's been shelved, new ways to use it, lots of new platforms for research. Um, uh, do, you, do you want to comment on that choice or Cynthia? I mean, you've been in the business a long time. You know, Cynthia, I'll let you take that one. 
Well, thank you. I think one of the very substantial trends is in robotic surgeries and uh, using technology to match up with the biotech world or the surgical world. I think that's very going to become more prominent. Right now, 25% of surgeries are done robotically. And I think that one of the other important trends will continue to be digital health. And there's very large amounts of money going into that space. I am a big admirer of a digital health fund out in the West Coast run by Boba Venkatadri and have made several introductions to Boba and his team. Uh, and they're on their second digital health fund. So I think that's going to be another area. And then I try to stay opportunistic and learn a little bit more. I think there's a lot more uh, theragnostic areas and uh, probably an expert like uh, Dr. Jay Evans could also give some insights on some areas that he thinks are gonna become more and more significant. This new Novartis drug for weight loss is uh, probably gonna be one of the biggest blockbusters of all time. So I think that people are gonna be more focused on things that allow them to uh, control some of their own day-to-day -day health. I think that's gonna be a, one of the biggest trends. What can I do to control my own day-to-day -day health? Well, and it's, it's so fascinating. Um, Mike sits on the board of Logan Health to watch uh, a ship being turned, if you will, from, we're gonna continue to offer, and America is the greatest country in the world for R&D, there's no doubt about it. And that's one of the best things our government does. Um, a company like Inimmune has just done a stellar job of uh, non-dilutive capital and great research, but, but more and more platforms for health and wellness and diagnostics as opposed to treating sick people. Um, and just if everybody wants a funny laugh, I don't know if anybody, I tuned into a presentation at the Consumer Electronics Show last week, where now you can buy a toilet that will send and, and data from your um, uh, uh, discharges every, in real time to your doctor and your phone. So there's just, I mean, you know, maybe that's a laugh today, but it's actually, the, I think those are the kind of things that are coming. We already know people are doing wearables that are constantly tracking everything. So I think diagnostics, uh, particularly, I love what I'm seeing in cancer vaccines. Um, there's, you know, vaccines are really a great area and I, and I agree with you. It's a great, great area in Montana. Um, Let's see, let's do, um, so if you were raising money as a biotech company in Montana, uh, Joyce, do you, do you feel like you can weigh in on that? I know Cynthia can, Matt, <laughs> I know I will. Well, I can give it from a financial services perspective because we typically are working with anywhere from series uh, C up to series A companies is, really they get a large injection of equity investment or even uh, debt investment via a small business loan. And what we try to help those customers out with is really the cash management of that through our financing or leasing products that they can basically preserve their capital and extend their cash runway out um, further than just a couple of years. Um, typically what we run into is a lot of customers, well, they'll get their series C and they'll spend it all on equipment and then they're scrambling for additional investment or an equ another equity raise to be able to get to the next six months. What we provide those customers when we try to explain to them is like, look, you know what? Don't invest hundred percent in your laboratory build out finance it or lease the items that you only need for a certain period of time so you can return them and upgrade to new technology um, when you need it and just to be able to extend your cash runway. So from a cash investment raise perspective, that's kind of how we work with those customers. Absolutely. Cynthia, would you like to add some more? Yeah. Hi, um, uh, Liz, this is Teresa Honos. I'm with Fisher Scientific and I partner with Choice quite a bit. Um, I have a question for you, Choice, with regards, and this, Liz, this might fall into your purview as well, and that is, so if we were to finance a particular set of equipment, is the customer or is the thermoscientific liable for any sort of asset taxes at the end of the year dependent upon the state? Um, really, it is state specific, and it's really dependent upon the type of the financial product that the customer leveraged. 
if the customer leases a, a piece of analytical instrumentation because they only need it for a certain period of time, most states typically levy a property tax, an annual property tax on that leased asset, um, kind of like how you get the annual property tax on your mortgage. Um, and so the customer is um, responsible for paying that property tax. Obviously, with every purchase, there's going to be a sales tax involved. Um, so for, for financial finance products, we just add that um, sales tax into the payment and the customer remits it back to me directly. But um, from a tax perspective, it's the, the tax payments are responsible for the customer. Thank you. And does it, is it also affected? So, for example, if they're using it for a reagent rental and it's a profit based um, lease, what are the potential tax implications there? Um, they, they would pretty much be the same because we're just dealing with the equipment side of it. Um, there's going to be for the reagent rental, um, they're going to have a lease on the equipment itself. And then the um, reagents that they are periodically get are pretty much purchased, but it's all rolled into one payment. So there's going to be sales tax on the, um, the, the reagents, but then there's probably going to be um, some small sales tax and property tax on the equipment that it does the um, analysis for. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And someone has put in the chat, is there, um, is there money for pre-revenue companies? Do people invest? I think every company we've invested in is a pre-revenue company, actually, because we're early stage investors and we're investing in science. Um, but the point that, he, that I would make to anybody raising money is know your investor. Know your investor. Every Science is complicated and know how long they've been investing, what wins they've had, um, are they, do they like certain verticals? What's their risk tolerance? Um, I mean, we just have some filters. One of ours is no one shot on gold because over and over again, I, I read an astounding number this week of the number of products that are, that fail in like phase three of trials is like 75%. It, it was just, I, I just, I had to look at it two or three times. I could not believe you know, biotech is a, as for an investor, know them. I mean, and there's so many um, new firms like Deerfield out of New York. That's a completely new kind of animal. They are soup to nuts for a scientist. If you want to just be in a lab and create things, they'll do like, a rev you know, some revenue share, or they'll do a licensing deal, or, you know, they'll just give you space. I mean, they're just, they are just interested in science. They've got in-house counsel. They've got, you know, everything. Uh, it's an enormous and a fairly new firm, a uh, lot, 2 billion, I think under management. Uh, I'm very interested to see how that all rolls out. Uh, we know our sweet spot is early stage and, you know, Mike's a billion dollar guy. He just likes, we, we have yet to do a device company, not to say we wouldn't, but, um, you know, it's, higher risk, higher reward. I mean, that's kind of our sweet spot, but really know your investor. There's just, there's so many ways to find out so much and don't waste your time with somebody who does devices. If what you're doing is, you know, early molecule development or, or new molecule development, just really, to me, that's really critical. And, you know, it, it's very interesting. We did a small seed fund to kind of test the thesis, uh, my thesis around in bioinformatics and things. And, you know, we did as little as $100,000 in a couple of companies. So um, the other thing I think that's really important, and it's been what I think one, is one of our competitive advantages, is we've won deals from much bigger firms because we bring more than money to the table. Our entire investment team are PhDs in deep expertise in certain areas of certain vertical areas, whether it's you know, genetics or, um, or bioinformatics, or we do have one, one person who uh, was at Beckton Dickinson for years and device, you know, analyzing new devices. So we've got huge deep industry legs that you don't, I mean, we don't have Harvard MBAs. We've got scientists here. So that is uh, sort of a different um, uh, model than, than other VCs. Um, but there are a lot of angels who do life science. There, there are angel groups that work together that do nothing but life science. And you can go on the Angel Capital Association. You can Google life science angels. Um, but just know your investor. And then, you know, the warmer the introduction, the, the shorter the path, just always remember that as well. Um, 
Let's see. You know, Liz, I'm glad you mentioned Deerfield because I have some experience with Deerfield. Oh, okay, and good. And one of the things that we are seeing as a financial solutions entity is these incubator investors, whether they provide soup to nut service for their um, lab partners to be able to develop their product, or it's just an incubator that provides the lab space, is we are seeing a lot of activity from the lease and financing perspective that um, these um, investors are looking to provide that service to the, their portfolio companies to be able to manage the investment that they are making in them so that company can be able to bring their product to market and make it through the trial successfully. So we do see a lot um, over the past two years, we've seen a lot of flow increase from a financial service perspective from that customer segment specifically. Absolutely. And New York, if you look over the last five years, they have an unbelievable incentive package to repurpose a lot of office space into biotech and life sciences. I know that Alexandria has just got an enormous amount of, uh, of square footage in New York. And, you know, the exciting thing in Montana, too, is having we're going to have two medical schools here, you know, within the next couple of years. And I think the opportunities for for clinical research, um, I know that Irv Weissman has already endowed five chair or five scholarships at the new um, Toro Medical School in Great Falls because he patented his very first he got his first intellectual property patent when he was in high school. He wasn't an athlete. He was a researcher. And, you know, his theory is, hey, there are smart people everywhere. And, I, I, you know, I think that history proves that over and over again. So, um, Liz, can I um, inject a question that's related maybe to this idea of community based or state based resources? Um, Straw poll, would the folks on the call today be supportive of a state funded revolving loan fund that would offer very low interest rate loans for communities to build out web, wet lab space? I don't, I, I just wanted to speak. I mean, we can definitely do our poll, but when you say community, I think you've got to find out who's the who's the really motivated party. Uh, it, you know, investors are motivated. They are motivated for the success. So who borrows the money? Who builds the building? You know, who's motivated and why for that? Um, I guess uh, I'm not exactly understanding how that would work. Is there a little bit more behind that ask of, because I, I, I actually just, I guess I just have that posture um, that I know how much money there is out there going into biotech. It's just absolutely astounding. Um, and I think it's all about who's your talent. What are that, you know, what are the areas they're working in? Uh, what are the discoveries being made? What are the opportunities? Um, you know, I mean, we've got companies in Montana that have been funded by Coastal Ventures and uh, that are quietly working. We've got a couple of Deerfield companies in Montana that are quietly working. So, you know, I think there's a, a tremendous um, need for um, the connection, if you will, between discovery and money in Montana. But I, I think we get, I, I do think, Matt, if you had 10 people lined up for space, would you build it? <laughs> if they're lined up, certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and and I just think that's a smart way to go. I really do. I don't know. I'd love to hear a divergent opinion on that. Hey, Liz, that was me that interjected that straw poll question. It's Brigitte. And okay. uh, I think one of the reasons that I was interested in that is, A, our legislative session is in progress right now. B, when we look at our state's tools for economic development, I know in the past and still, I mean, we have a number of different revolving loan funds that are targeted to certain uses. And although I, I agree with you that if you can get enough critical mass behind the private sector just coming together and signing up to, to build out a project, that's best. But the likelihood of that need and desire aligning with the ability to pay or finance of these smaller startup firms. It's just, it's always in perpetual misalignment. So one of the things that I was curious about is, would there be any appetite at the legislative session to maybe take some of these revolving loan fund type programs that we already have in place 
and kind of tweak it so that there is funding that's dedicated specifically to addressing uh, community needs to, to build something like this out that can help those firms really in their, their infancy before they're ready to, to, to go to the maps and the choices and say, hey, we finally have, you know, we're finally at the point where we can afford this and we've got the, uh, you know, the, the, the financial wherewithal to do it. So, but, that's but what I was getting still, at. again, is the community. I mean, who's the, who's yeah. the, the management entity that, yep. Do, yep. I mean, and, and those revolving loan funds. Group or, that's what, that's the piece I don't really get. I mean, we don't have like a, a life science authority. Um, I mean, New York does that. And maybe that's what we need to do is have a, a you know, a, a, a sort of a governing body that, uh, you know, I, well, I, I think what would happen is it, it's, um, it's like economic development entities around the state would probably be eligible applicants to apply on behalf of uh, whoever that may be, or whether it's a specific company or an entity, uh, to tap into that revolving loan fund. And that this is getting a little wonky, but um, obviously it's something I'd love to see just because the cost of capital right now is so expensive. <laughs> um, it, it's really going to tamp down and a lot of the ability of some of the places that elsewhere in the state to do anything, to, to, to create that pathway for invention. Um, if it's not in Missoula or it's not in Bozeman, it's not happening right now on the bio front. And, and we'd like to change that, I think, all of us on that call. Oh, well, we tend to disagree. I think we're going to have some stuff happening in White Bridge pretty soon. Oh, <laughs> yes. Okay, my bad. Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I, I did say right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, you know, in principle, I totally, it would be wonderful. I, I'm not sure. Um, it, one of the challenges that we have always with the legislature, because, you know, I did a lot of advocacy over my lifetime um, before I came here as well, is that they have priorities and water and sewer in rural communities always trumps new life science buildings in other parts of the state. And it just gets to be a really, a really hard lift there. But I, 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 we absolutely need to find a way to meet unmet needs in, in, in the life sciences. And, uh, you know, I do think initially through the universities, this probably makes the most sense right now, but we're also seeing- Liz, oh, sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. And then I wanted I was just um, say, to highlight a point in the chat. We've, we've looked at lots of models for uh, non-university non affiliated research organizations, you know, JJ Labs, there's, and more and more, we're seeing dispersal as opposed to aggregation. People are, uh, there's, and there's a lot going on at the federal level in that regard. Uh, I spoke to somebody yesterday. Uh, they're getting ready to launch an America's Frontier Fund out of the Defense Department that's also going to um, you know, be playing in the life science area. Um, but, you know, mostly I just think as a community, we, we really need to come together and, and sort of really think through what, what works for us and, and you know, have some short-term, mid-term and long-term aspirations. Um, but one of the things Great right point. now, oh. we, need, we need a lot of data. I mean, I was trying to, Mike is thinking about buying a gene sequencer for our lab. And um, he said, how many gene sequences were in Montana? Well, you know what? It's really hard to find out. Nobody wants to tell you, but I did find out that graduate students at the University of Montana are sending their genetic samples to China to be sequenced because it's faster and cheaper. And there, there are sequencers sitting on the campus not being used. I mean, there's just, we, we really need to figure out what, 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 what's here, what's being used. And I've got wildlife biologists calling me every day going, are you going to get that sequencer? Because the data, the amount of data we have in life, in wildlife biology trumps anything in the world in the state of Montana, as does um, what Shodare has in terms of, um, rare disease for, you know, children. Um, and, you know, we've got somebody on our team who was at Illumina and designed the, the MySeq. I mean, we're two generations past that now, but um, it's just it's just one of the issues. So, and, and go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ramble. Yeah, uh, we, we have had some uh, good points made in the chat about other models that we might learn from. Uh, Krista Kroll had suggested Alberta Innovates. Uh, having an interesting model of this type of decision-making. 
Um, and there are also some of the larger entities, McLaughlin Research Institute in Great Falls has been mentioned, has considered using some of their excess space, making that available to small companies, um, uncertain of where they're at in that, but there could be ways that our uh, larger yes. research institutes could be partners with um, scientists in the startup phase as well. Um, and if others have opinions or thoughts on this idea of things that we could be doing at a state level or community level, be advocating for um, other models that states are, um, you know, that have been done globally, uh, would love to hear from that too. We also had an interesting question about um, AI and machine learning as a trend in the biotech space. Uh, the comment, it's interesting to think about this in terms of lab space and the need for less lab build out. Does anyone have thoughts on this trend? I don't, in terms of how it relates to lab space. Um, I think I commented on the chat in there. One thing that I've seen is just like visiting UW and their massive research complex there. Um, in their newer build outs, they are lessening the footprint of that actual sort of really super expensive wet lab space and instead creating sort of this, you know, wet lab adjacent bullpen workspace, right? So they're they're pulling at that out of the lab and that's where those people are, are doing, you know, utilizing the AI, et cetera. So, that, I mean, that's one thing I've seen. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, I'm, I, I keep thinking about the specific examples I've seen of AI being used, for example, in x-ray reading or, or, you know, scan reading where, you take the human out of it. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of humans being taken out of a lot of decision making, which is, you know, I think pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, we are getting close to our final um, hour. Um, I certainly want to thank everybody for their participation. Great conversation. Um, I hope we'll do this more and often because I think there's a lot of just base information that we all need to share with each other about what's going on and who's doing what and you know, who knows what and who's got talent and looking for something. Um, are there any more questions? We have a few more minutes. If anybody's got just a burning question or comment to make. Liz, this is Cynthia. And I wanted to mention that February 8th, the Montana legislature will be meeting with the Montana Bio Alliance at the Delta Hotel. Yes, it's February 8th. I think it's at 530. Yep. And you can go on the Bioscience Alliance website and register for that. And, you know, I, I think that excellent point, the numbers do speak to the legislature. And I think the more people that show up and, and talk about the opportunities, because um, they're enormous, because as we, as I, I've started with calling myself decades, it's levels now, as I approach later levels in life, health is wealth. And, and we all need to be focused on, on being healthier for sure. Any other final remarks? Well, thank you um, for all the partners, the Bioscience Alliance, the World Trade Center, the uh, Bioscience Cluster Initiative, and certainly to our participants and uh, Christina and Cassandra. Any final words? Um, I would just say that we will uh, collect the resources and the insights provided in the chat. So if anybody has links to particular events, resources, case studies, um, you know, if you want to put your contact information as a potential resource for startups or, or biotech companies in Montana, please add that and we can collect that and we'll send that out to all the participants along with the, the video of the chat, but I do want to thank you, Liz, Choice, Matt, and Cynthia, and to the Bioscience Cluster Initiative for partnering with us today. A recording, again, will be made available on the website and sent out to all who registered. So if you want to share this information with your colleagues as well, you can pass that along. The Montana High Tech Business Alliance will be hosting more events in 2023 in partnership with the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. You can keep tabs at mthitech.org events. And again, we thank everyone for joining us today.